Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. It's much too early to have any kind of genuine certainty about what the last 10 years have meant. About 13 years ago, 13 years and two months, I was on the Shomali Plains, which is a fertile area just north of Kabul in Afghanistan. It's one of the rare places in Afghanistan where fruit and vegetables grow very well, or at least they did until the irrigation was destroyed during the war against the Soviets. I was on the southern rim of the plains where there's a small ridge before it all drops away to Kabul. On that ridge was a small group of Taliban fighters who welcomed me fairly amiably with some green tea and some grapes. They were there to block the road south from Bagram Airport, which was a, a strip, really, a base, which was a long concrete airstrip constructed by the Russians in the 70s. Four years later, I was back on the Shomali Plains and back on the same ridge, looking down again at Bagram Airport, uh, which now was actually an airport. It now had a thousand or so American troops all busy digging out trenches, constructing hangars, barrack blocks. I was just genuinely bewildered at this sudden eruption in Afghanistan of these thousands of American soldiers and what was happening to Bagram. The contrast was extreme for me at the time and I was wondering that question that journalists always ask themselves, what is happening here? What, what is this about? I think now, 10 years later, as I say, we can suggest some answers. We can see something that's emerging from the 10 years in between. One question that obviously is there to be asked is, is, is this one conflict or many conflicts? The many ideologues on both sides, if you like, have tried to place this conflict in a very unified narrative, if you like. One side against the other, Islam versus the West, good versus evil, whatever. Is it one conflict or is it many conflicts? When you're on the ground as a reporter, it very much looks like many conflicts. You have communities against communities, tribes against tribes, different strands of religious belief against different strands of religious belief. I remember when I was in Iraq being told by an American official that they had six separate conflicts going on in their area of control, which was just north of Baghdad. That's what it looks like on the ground. Is it one conflict? Is it many conflicts? I think actually it's both. I'd say that it's one conflict because there are, and that was increasingly obvious towards the end of the decade, um, shared elements, particular tactics, particular forms of violence, spectacular violence, the use of the image. Often the image, uh, an image created by a protagonist, which is something new, uh, never seen in war before. We've seen lots of images and the use of images and manipulation or the effect of images, but very those images have not been taken by soldiers themselves. They're made by militants themselves. So I'm thinking of, for example, the Abu Ghraib pictures, which were actually only the f uh, one of or one set of a huge amount of photographic or visual material created by uh, American and other, including British soldiers, depicting acts of violence or abuse of prisoners, or indeed their uh, mirror image, atrocious mirror image, the terrorists' own videos. Um, course of the war, I think that's now clear turning point around 2005, 2006, only five years ago, but the genuine sense of dread, the genuine feel that, feeling that things were going out of control, that there was violence in Iraq, there was violence in Afghanistan, that there was violence on the streets of London, that it didn't look like people could stop this violence, it was going to continue, that there were crazy people in Washington, there were crazy people in wherever, and we were all in the middle of it, and it looked very, very bleak, and now it looks much better. And that turning point is very interesting. I'm not an academic, I'm not an analyst, I'm a reporter, so again, I, I tend to build things out of anecdotes, people I meet, things I hear, stuff I see, and then I go off and cross-reference, talk to other people, is there any scientific or better evidence that might back this up? And what I think happened in 
I might be wrong, uh, but I think uh, fairly convinced it happened in 2005, 2006. It's something that has been crucial all the way along this whole set of conflicts, and that is uh, a confrontation between local identities, local sense of being involved in a community with its own interests, local priorities, and global ideologies and global narratives. And that I started thinking about that when I was interviewing a series of militants between 2002 and 2006, seven when they kept saying things like one who, a lot of them were suicide bombers, failed, clearly. They, a lot of them were, had got, were in prison and they were talking about how they'd got to the stage where they were literally about to flick the switch and what had stopped them doing that. And several mentioned that it was when they heard the accents of people they were about to blow up and realized that they were from their hometown. And when I started looking, I started seeing them everywhere. Um, the Taliban fighters are local. Apparently, according to the Americans, they're telling me in June in Kabul, 80% of Taliban they kill or capture in, in Afghanistan are killed or captured within uh, 20 kilometers, I think, of their hometown. And I started looking at all the terrorist incidents. And yeah, of course, 9-11, international. Um, various others, international. The vast majority are local, are done by people down the road. So. I started thinking much more about the local and the global. And then I started thinking much more about stuff that was going on in Iraq at the time with the turning of the Iraqi Western tribes against Al-Qaeda. Why? Because Al-Qaeda is as globalizing, as disrespectful of local difference as anything that's come out of Washington. The Al-Qaeda message did not match the local message, did not match their views. That's what they seem to be saying to me. And that's what on a vast scale, determine that turning point. If you look at the polls, it's very clear that at each moment when violence reaches a substantial level in any country, the support for Al-Qaeda or for suicide bombing or for whatever plummets. End of 2005, right in the middle of this crucial period I'm talking about. You have early November, uh, approval levels for Bin Laden, for Al-Qaeda, for suicide bombing and so forth, up to 60 to 80 percent. End of November, 20 percent, 15, 25, depending on the question. What happened in between? A series of big bombs hitting hotels in the center of Oman, killing Jordanians in the middle of a wedding. Same thing everywhere. Ka uh, Morocco, Egypt, Pakistan, Indonesia, Turkey, everywhere. Because when it becomes real, because when it becomes local, it is recognized that, that it is fundamentally contrary to the interests of any one community. Where are we now then, after this, this 10 years with this crucial point in 05, 06? Where is Al-Qaeda now? Um, uh, Al-Qaeda is in a pretty bad place. I, I wouldn't want to write its obituary yet, but it's chronically ill. Worth remembering, of course, that Al-Qaeda is only one element of the phenomenon of contemporary Sunni Islamic militancy. And therefore, many others might, given the right conjunction of circumstances, grow in strength. I think, honestly, the, the whole 9-11, the whole operation of 9-11, the strength that Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda had accumulated by 2000, 2001, now does look very much of its time and not something that could be repeated, a particular set of factors allowing that, that I, I see very, di very difficult to reproduce. I think if anything else comes out of Islamic militancy, it's going to be as new and as innovative, if you like, as Bin Laden and his strategies and tactics were. Just briefly on the Arab revolts, I think there are two things we need to remember with them. Um, one is this localism, this local difference. Um, what, even within the revolts, it's this local identity that's going to determine what comes out of them, particularly somewhere like Libya, but also elsewhere. The other thing is that whatever comes out of them is likely to involve a mild Islamism, if you like, a moderate Islamism, or a religious identity of a strength or of a conservatism that will that is certainly not what the West, in inverted commas, would like to see, but will almost certainly have to accept if 
any kind of stability is to be achieved. When you think about the 9-11 attacks, the extraordinary thing about what happened, you know, when we think about them, we think about New York, we don't think about the Pentagon, and we don't think about the one which didn't happen, because we think about the image. Mm. And what was so unusual about what happened in New York was not only the number of people who were killed, which is actually less than was thought at the time, it was that certainly, because there were two planes, the second plane was caught on camera because all those cameras in New York meant that they could swivel to look at this vista and then catch the second one going in. Nowadays, you do actually catch the moment of explosion because somebody has probably got their mobile phone yeah. on and sends it somewhere. But at that point, you didn't. And so it was almost an accident that this explosion happened and worked because an awful lot of them don't. And so... I was wondering, in, in the way you say Al-Qaeda is chronically ill and it looks dated and there's been a turning point and it's sort of moment has come and gone, if glo local trumps the global mm. so that these things are driven in the end by what's happening locally and not globally, um, even if the global message has failed to ignite, just as George Bush's global war on terror was so miscast, how can we make a valid judgment for the question we all yearn to know, which is 10 years on, even with Osama bin Laden dead, is it really true that this phenomenon has peaked and is in decline? Or could there be another accident where the image happens to make it live onto television, which will again shock us to the core and make us feel that we're starting the clock again? Because actually, that isn't about the network behind it, is it? It's also about the, it's about the event image. and how we respond to it. Bin Laden was trying to do something with 9-11 which was radically beyond what his co-conspirators, if you like, or the, the other senior Al-Qaeda militants could even really contemplate doing. I mean, they were still in a very 90s, even 80s logic of uh, long campaigns, strategic targets. They were focused, again, still quite locally. 9-11 only came six years after uh, Ayman al zawahri was bombing Egypt as his main target. Um, and Bin Laden recognized that you needed to something that was so dramatic that you, w you could shift everything into something that had never before been contemplated. You could sort of skip all the, sca the stages. But, but he was th wasn't the only one with this vision. I mean, the World Trade Center had been attacked before. Yeah, but although not, in the, like Ramsey Yusuf did it in 93 and didn't bring it down. Um, that's the point, but, isn't it? That yeah. It didn't work. But and Yusuf was Yusuf was um, a kind of oddball anyway. And if you look at his demands, they're very kind of classic terrorist demands. Yusuf. I mean, this was one of the things that Bin Laden didn't really have at that stage. I mean, there were no demands. I mean, it was something that was kind of cosmically different. It was just a vast, spectacular, shock incredible and shock and awe. It, propaganda by deed to the nth degree. And in many ways, it worked because it, the whole aim of it was to, to, to have such a huge impact that you always, you had to think differently about things. 9-11 posed questions in many ways, much more than it gave answers. It, it was very open-ended. Um, and that reaction of a billion or so people going, hmm, I've never thought about my faith like this before. I've never f even thought of myself as primarily a Muslim, is what, in many ways, he wanted to achieve. Uh, the next step is the radicalization and the mobilization. So I think that's what he was trying to do with 9-11. And in that sense, he succeeded. And it took us many years to recover from that. And indeed, <laughs> the effects are very much still there. You also analyze in quite meticulous detail various aspects of the response. You know, the wars are also not just what happened in Afghanistan in 2001, but what happened in Iraq and what's happening now in Afghanistan. And I was just thinking of the response. I remember when, I, when, when the attacks happened, um, I remember thinking, oh no, this is terrible because George W. Bush won't be able to restrain himself from the knee-jerk reaction which is exactly what Osama bin Laden wants, which will turn this into a conflict. And then, to my surprise, 
for a while, it seemed as though he was listening to other counsel and he was trying to build up a coalition and there was a pause and um, you know, Iran was brought on board to some extent, for example. Um, maybe Pakistan was partly coerced, but it was an attempt for it not to be that clash of civilizations that it looked as though it was going to be provoked. But, you know, we can, it's always fun to play the game of counterfactuals and you look back to the 2000 election and think, well, you know, what if those hanging chads hadn't hung? Supposing it had been Al Gore, who might very easily have been president, would the Western response in the end have been different? Or actually, were we sort of trapped by this image into a response given what we knew at the time, the sense of insecurity, of more attacks to come, where it wouldn't have been very different. The immediate response, leaving aside the legal machinations that were going on to allow Abu Ghraib and torture, the, the, which is a big leaving aside, but the, uh, the immediate military response and counter-terrorist response was in many ways not, well, quite traditional, expeditionary force sent to far-flung land, Relatively innovative, okay, will depend on technology, laser sighting, small groups of special forces, CIA, etc., on the ground. Um, and relatively successful. Apart from catching bin Laden, the Taliban were deposed and the terrorist camps were obliterated. And by the end of March 2003, most 9-11 plotters had been rounded up and had been caught, the major players. Uh, and up to that point, most things were, some of them were controversial, but were relatively successful, and leaving again aside the legal side of things, um, did it, were, were reasonable, I think. It's then that you see an, this sudden reaction, I think born of perhaps the success of that earlier period, where you get Iraq happening, um, you get uh, the worst of the abuses, I was talking about Bagram Airport earlier. I was staying there on and off as a kind of guest of the Americans on embeds. Um, and it fascinated me that while I was there, just down the road, there were atrocious things happening in, in, the, in the prison they'd built. What it was really scary when you look at the, how that abuse developed was that it, it developed earlier, than, or rather the, 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 the legal element at the top with Bush signing off on torture memos and such like, which allowed it to happen. In, a, in terms of presidential approval or it coming down from the administration, was in parallel with it coming up from below. So even by early November, American special forces in North, America, in North Afghanistan were taking photos of prisoners, uh, burning them, using cigarettes, possibly using electrodes, all sorts of other things. So this is almost as if there was this double process of on the ground, ordinary men, basically, put into an extraordinary environment who do atrocious things. So the very fact of 9-11 created an extraordinary environment so I for think, all of us. I think it created something, which is why I think this, this is a war, even though I continually emphasise the kind of diversity of these conflicts. But I think this was an entity in that it was, there's something particularly, there's some particular elements. You know, every war has its particular elements. You know, that kind of Vietnam, it's... it's uh, pot smoking soldiers and helicopters, uh, you know, and it's quite interesting to think about what will be the kind of iconic elements of this conflict. And what almost certainly one of them will be you know, Abu Ghraib, the the hooded man, torture of prisoners, uh, as 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 one of the most significant elements. I can't remember who it was who first came up with the metaphor of um, the response to 9/11 being like putting a great big boot in a puddle when you try and sort of hit the puddle and all you do is you spatter the droplets everywhere and then you end up with droplets that you can't see and how do you deal with them? Yeah. And um, I was thinking of two sorts of droplets. One is um, the volunteers, the 7-7 seven -seven bombers, the people who, for one reason or another, and Iraq, of course, is part of that, possibly, um, are inspired to carry on, carry the torch. Is that going to make a difference or are they now a new generation of lone wolves or yeah. self-sustaining cells. And the other, the other question on that is um, a new type of localism, even if Al-Qaeda, with its global vision of jihad, is no longer what everyone wants to print on their T-shirt, that there's going to be a new type of 
I think a new a new a new stage in this war, which means that it's it's not over yet, and it may even be worse. It's worth remembering that what Al Qaeda did, and expressly set out to do, was to draw together all the various local, pr it already existing strands of activism. So what I think we're seeing now is that uh, drawing together of of different strands has now unraveled. The, the ideology that Bin Laden created is a sort of free-floating, easy, off-the-wall package that explains everything, that gives you a program, and gives you an end state. And that's great. In, that brings, that's a fantastic resource to have. But after a while, you run into significant problems with it because it isn't sufficiently localized. And it's the same problem that big multinational corporations face when they're trying to sell hamburgers or whatever it is. It's there's the branding. And then the problem is actually that people in India don't eat beef. This is what I'm trying to get at is that this idea of Bin Laden being a kind of, or Al Qaeda being a resistance movement to globalization isn't to me very well founded. It's much more the case that Bin Laden's ideas are an alternative form of globalization that local communities eventually resisted in the same way that they had resisted other forms previously. So you buy the hamburgers and the Pepsi to begin with and then you realize it doesn't actually yeah, work. You turn, and then so you turn to, yeah, or exactly. Or what they did in, in Iraq, which was um, you, f you start fighting the Americans with Al-Qaeda on board at your sides and then you start having significant problems with the Al-Qaeda people and you reject them as well and you try and find your own way through the mess of local politics and context. 